Hello again. This is Math 2233 coming to you from the College of DuPage. And this is the second continuation of the lecture introducing partial derivatives. As always, please be an active learner as you watch this video. Partial derivatives can also be defined for functions of three or more variables. For example, if f is a function of three variables, x, y, and z, then its partial derivative with respect to x is defined as f sub x of x, y, and z is the limit as h goes to 0 of, we're letting the x variable uh, vary. So this is f of x plus h, y, and z minus f of x, y, z all over h, and is found by regarding y and z is constants and differentiating f of x, y, and z with respect to x. Now, if w is equal to this function, f of x, y, and z, then the partial with respect to x is the partial of w with respect to x, and this is the rate of change of w with respect to x when y and z are held fixed. But in four dimensions, there is no geometric interpretation. In general, if u is a function of n variables, u is equal to f of x1, x2, dot, 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 all the way up to xn, its partial derivative with respect to the ith variable is the partial of u with respect to xi is, we uh, let this be the limit as h goes to 0 of, this one is perturbed by h, so the only variable that's changing is x sub i, so this is x sub i plus h, minus f of all those variables all over h, and we write uh, this. So this is the partial view with respect to xi. Now, we lose physical interpretation of these things, but these also could have huge applications in business and other kinds of optimization problems. So let's calculate a few of these. So let's find the partial of f with respect to x the partial of f with respect to y, and the partial of f with respect to z if f of x, y, z is equal to e to the x, y times the ln of z. You know what to do. Let's see how you did. All right, so if we hold y and z constant and we're differentiating with respect to x, uh, we're just differentiating the exponentials, so it's going to be y e to the x, y, l, and z. If I differentiate with respect to y, there's a symmetry with x, so that's just going to be x e to the x, y, l, and z. If we take the derivative with respect to z, e to the x, y is a constant, and the derivative of l, n of z is 1 over z. We can also take higher order derivatives. So if f and higher order partial derivatives. So if f is a function of two variables, then its partial derivatives fx and fy are also functions of two variables. And so we consider the partial derivatives of them. So we can take the derivative again with respect to x, the derivative again with respect to y, and the derivative uh, with respect to x of fy and fyy. So these are called the second partial derivatives. So if z is equal to f of xy, these are notations that are used. So fxx means you take the derivatives in these orders. fxy means the derivatives are taken in this order. fyx means it's taken in this order. So you see when we're using this notation, you first take the derivative that is closest there. And fyy uh, is going to be this. Now notice when you talk about what you're taking first, though, that you end up writing it this way and this way, this way, and this way. So you see, whenever we write this, f of xy written this way looks like the second partial of uh, f, and then it, the y comes first and the x happens there. So thus the notation fxy or this means we first differentiate with respect to x and then with respect to y. Whereas in computing f, y, x, the order is reversed in both cases. Let's do another problem. Find the second partial derivatives, and there are uh, 
several of them, fxx, fxy, fyx, and fyy of this polynomial. f of xy is equal to x cubed plus x squared y cubed minus 2y squared. You know what to do. Let's see how you did. Okay, so fxx is going to be 6x plus 2y cubed. fxy is going to be 6xy squared. fyx is going to be 6xy squared. And fyy is 6x squared y minus 4. Now notice that fxy is the same thing as fyx. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, we, we have... Um, all of these um, uh, derivatives that we found, but we also found that here it looks like it didn't make a difference. Let's talk about that a bit. And so notice that that was true. That's not a coincidence. It turned out that the mixed partials fxy and fyx are equal for most functions that one meets in practice. If the second partial derivatives are continuous functions, that is true. The following theorem, which was discovered by the French mathematician uh, Clairaut, uh, gives conditions under which we can assert that this is true, and we're going to look at the proof of this in just a minute. So Clairaut's theorem says, suppose f is defined on a disk at a uh, containing the point a, b, and if the functions are both continuous on that domain, that disk, then the cross partials are equal and it doesn't matter in which order you do them. Uh, Clairo was an interesting person in math history. He was a prodigy. He presented a paper um, at the uh, French Academy of Sciences when he was 13. And uh, at the age of 18, he uh, wrote a very systematic uh, treatise on uh, three-dimensional analytic geometry and space curves. He also has a very famous uh, differential equation and partial differential equations named after him as well. Let's look at the proof of that. Okay, so for small values of h, we can look at this difference. And you see what we're doing here is we're really saying what happens when f of a plus h minus f of b, uh, f of a plus h, b plus h, minus f of a plus h, b, minus f of a, b plus h, minus f of b. Now, when you uh, look at this, uh, uh, what's going to happen is that if we let g of x be f of x b plus h minus f of x b. Now, those are the terms here uh, where we have, um, uh, you know, x is, x is really the first variable and the other one you just have it going this way. The, and uh, if you take delta x to be this, then we can have the mean value theorem tells us that um, g at this number minus g of the other number is going to be, there's a number between such that the derivative of g uh, is equal to this difference um, uh, times h, and that is h times this by definition. Now, if we did the same thing, Applying the mean value theorem again, this time to f of x, we could find a number d between b and b plus h, such that f of x uh, of this is equal to, this difference is equal to, now this is the partial uh, fxy of cd times h. So if we combine those equations, we find out that delta of h, the thing we have, is equal to h squared f of x, y, c, d. And as h goes to 0, c, d approaches a, b. So the continuity tells us that the limit as h goes to 0 of this is equal to f of x, y, a, b. Now similarly, by writing this as delta h, using the mean value theorem twice again, and the continuity of x, y x at a b we obtain this so you see uh, this the first is equal to the second the second is equal to the third so the first is equal to the third and that is the proof
We can also talk about partial derivatives of even a higher order of 3 or higher can be defined. So for example, this f sub xyy is fxy times y and is equal to this. And this means that you do the uh, x first, then you do y twice. So by using Clairet's theorem, uh, that this is that the order doesn't matter as long as all these functions are continuous. And even though there are anomalies, nature is usually continuous. So let's do one of these higher order derivatives. So calculate f, x, x, y, z. If f of x, y, z is equal to the sine of 3x plus y, z. This is the argument here. You know what to do. Let's see how you did. So when you take the derivative with respect to, uh, to x, you get cosine of this times the 3 because you're taking the derivative inside. And again, y and z are constants. fxx then is going to be you're taking the derivative with respect to x again. And you're going to uh, get minus sine. And another 3 points out, pops out, so you get that. Now when you take the derivative of this with respect to y, you're going to get minus 9, and then you're taking the derivative of this getting cosine. But now uh, what you're going to have is there's a z pops out because you're taking the derivative using the chain rule with respect to y. And last but not least, when you take the derivative with respect to z, uh, you're going to get, um, uh, and it is going to be a product rule now, so it is going to be minus 9, that's the derivative of the first, times the second plus 9z times the derivative of the second, which is going to be, um, and, and that is going to be the derivative of the cosine is minus sine, and we get 9yz sine 3x plus yz. Make sure that you can do these calculations. In the same way that we have differential equations, we have partial differential equations, and these occur uh, in many physical laws. And for example, this one, where we're taking the second partial with respect to x uh, plus the second partial with respect to y is equal to zero, is called Laplace's equation after Pierre Laplace. And solutions of this equation are called harmonic functions. And there's a whole field of mathematics called harmonic analysis. And they play a role in uh, mathematic problems of heat conduction, fluid flow, and potentials, including electric potential. So uh, let's uh, show that this function, u of xy, is e to the x sine y, is a solution of Laplace's equation. So we're going to substitute that in and see that uh, the Laplace's equation is equal to 0. You know what to do. Let's see how you did. So we're going to take the first partial, getting this, and the second partial getting this with respect to x. First partial with respect to y gives this. The second partial with respect to y gives this. If you add those two together, you get 0. Therefore, u does satisfy Laplace's equation. And this is an important thing. Now, we just showed that this was the case. Use a technique called, for partial differential equations, separation of variables uh, in order to solve this. Another very important uh, equation of mathematical physics is called the wave equation. This is the one-dimensional wave equation. And you say the second partial of u with respect to t is equal to alpha squared, or a squared, I guess. And then this is the partial of u with respect to uh, x. And this is the second partial of u with respect to x. And this ends up being the Laplacian in three dimensions. Um, and um, this describes the motion of a waveform. And this could be an ocean wave, a sound wave, a light wave, or a wave traveling along a vibrating string. And this is the model that we use to derive that. So if u of xy represents the displacement of a vibrating violin string at time t at a distance x from one end of the string, then u of xy satisfies the wave equation. And the constant depends on the density of the uh, string and the tension in the string. There's a lot of uh, math in music, actually. 
And so here's a picture uh, showing you that this is the displacement over time at, uh, at x. So it goes up and down like this over time. So as an exercise, let's verify that the function u of xt equals sine of x minus at satisfies the wave equation. You know what to do. Let's see how you did. So when you take the first partial with respect to x, uh, what happens is you just get the cosine of x minus at. When you take the partial with respect to x again, you get uxx is equal to minus sine x minus at. But when you take the partial with respect to t, what happens is you have uh, this minus a that pops out, and here you have utt. Then you take the partial again, it's minus a squared, because um, uh, this is the minus stays there, and the derivative of the cosine is, uh, is going, you, you get a, a second negative uh, because of the chain rule here. So this is the same thing as a squared times uxx. So u does satisfy the wave equation. Uh, and partial uh, differential equations involving functions of three variables are very important because this is in space. And uh, so, um, and, and in fact, the equations that we talked about for heat conduction, the wave equation, and even the Laplacian equal to zero do occur in, uh, in physics. And if u, x, y, and z represents a magnetic strength at a, at a point, then uh, that in fact will satisfy this. So that's a, that's a potential function. The strength of the magnetic field indicates the distribution of iron-rich um, minerals and reflects different rock types and location of faults. And so we'll look at a figure that shows a contour map of the Earth's magnetic field as recorded from an aircraft that has a, a meter measuring magnetism and is flying above the surface. And we've used color coding so you can see the uh, regions where there are level curves. So you see we can get this kind of uh, equation. You can see that that really is a contour map. And this figure 10 shows a contour map of the second order partial derivative of u in the vertical direction. This is u of, and, and this is um, zz. It turns out that the values of the partial derivatives uxx and uyz are relatively easy measured. And so these values can be calculated from Laplace's equation because we know it's equal to zero. Some serious science going on here. Uh, let's talk about one other example that we've talked about before, the Cobb-Douglas production function. Now, if the production function is denoted by P, production is equal to P of LT, where this is label and labor and capital, then the partial derivatives, um, the partial of P with respect to L, is at rate at which the uh, production changes with respect to the labor, and that's called the marginal production with respect to labor. And likewise, this derivative is called the marginal productivity of capital. Now, uh, we make some assumptions that Cobb and Douglas made in their study. So uh, if either of these vanishes, then so will production. So, uh, so we, we cannot have um, these things are always uh, bigger than zero. And the marginal productivity of labor is proportional to the amount of production per unit time of labor. And the marginal productivity of capital similarly is, production to, is proportional to the amount of production per unit of capital. So that means this is true because this is the production per capital. And if we keep k constant, that is k is equal to some constant, then this can be solved by separation of variables. Uh, and we are solving this ordinary differential equation. So if we use separation of variables solving this, we get that P of L, and this is at K0, is just L raised to some power alpha. And the constant that is here is a function of K0. And we've written that because uh, we know that this could be, this constant, uh, it was a partial derivative, so this constant could be a function of k. So it really depends on the value of k0. Similarly, the other one, 
says we have this and we can solve that and that says this is C2 L0 and this is K beta alpha and beta do not have to be the same number so if we compare those two equations we see that P is equal to this for some values of um, uh, B, uh, alpha, and beta. Now, if labor and capital are both increased by a factor of M, and we want to include the assumption that if they're both increased by a factor of M, we'll produce, improve the production by M, you have to have alpha plus beta equals 1. And they made that assumption, and therefore we get this equation. And this is the production function that we talked about in an earlier section. In closing, now more than ever, time is precious. Each day must count. Do the math, it will make you strong. And now more than ever, take care of yourself and of each other. May God bless you all.